Welcome to Comic Book Herald's Cree Annotators. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of Comic Book Herald, and I'll be interviewing some of my favorite creators in comics about specific runs, graphic novels, or series, looking for their insights or inspiration behind the work, and some ideas or hidden material readers may have missed. Today, I'm excited to welcome Darcy Van Polgeest, author of Little Bird, The Fight for Elder's Hope, one of my favorite comics of the last few years. Little Bird explores a dystopic but parallel Earth where the United Nations of America rules via theocracy in a world run rampant with dark science and genetic, genetic modifications. It's a gory, visceral, poetic exploration of resistance against theocratic fascist regimes. Darcy, thanks so much for joining us today. I want to ask you first off, you mentioned in Little Bird number one that the uh, the work was in progress for several years. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, bit about how the story came to be? Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for having me on. Um, just to say that first. And Absolutely. Uh, I think it's um, important to say that uh, that uh, before we start recording, Dave and I just quick chat about that uh, this is incredibly difficult days that are surrounding us. Um, I almost felt like, should we be doing this? It feels weird to be celebrating yeah. and talking about anything um other than what's happening but um um we still uh we need to to find joy where we can um so anyways thanks for having me on I'm, and i'm i am glad we're doing it but yeah little bird took um little bird took forever <laughs> um and really it was just i was working full-time as a director at the time, um, yeah. doing doing commercial work, which was my, you know, that was my day job up until about well, until Little Bird came out, basically. Mm -hmm. And I've sort of switched gears, and I'm writing full time at this point. But, um, but which you know, I owe to Little Bird, and um, but yeah, the the idea is really accumulation. It, it's so hard to say because. I think it's, it's quite often happens with first works, and this is my first my first graphic novel. Yeah, um, not my first creative project that I've written, but my first comic. Or um, and uh, it was really just an accumulation of so many things in my life um, that I just kind of dumped into this universe. You know. Yeah through the mad, mad skills of Ian Bertram mm -hmm. and the rest of the team. But um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I come from like a, a long line of, um, um, of parents and grandparents that um, have sort of stood up against the status quo in different, different ways, you know, mm -hmm. as really, inspired by that and um at the same time i was i was doing commercials i would do um some a little bit of work for the government and a little bit of nonprofit work in the sort of documentary uh field um working with indigenous communities and hmm. um uh filming interviews with elders um and a lot of that almost all of it focused around um, residential schools and the lasting impacts and the intergenerational trauma from residential schools. Mm. And, um, and at the same time, this goes back like almost eight years ago now that I wrote the story. Yeah. Um, so it was a long time ago and it was really before th there just wasn't a lot of talk of, there was a lot of talk within the indigenous community and within the nonprofits organizations that were um, uh, involved in education and re-education of indigenous culture, which had been lost hmm. um, over a generation because of the legacy of residential schools. Um, but there was no really at that time it was just before it kind of broke into mainstream conversation 
Um, and so can I you, had this. Can you define that actually for, for yeah. both myself and listeners, the, the residential schools that you're describing? I'll admit that's not uh, something I'm super familiar with. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, I mean, it happened in the States too, for sure. But um, yeah, and I'm in Canada, just so everyone knows. Um, but that, that basically was the, the, I'll give the most simple version of it, is that the government took um, Indigenous kids away from their families mm-hmm. and put them into uh, Christian-run schools in order to strip them of their language and their culture and to Europeanize them, yeah. m- make, yeah. them make them white, so that they assimilated into the you know, Commonwealth um, country that the British were trying to, to establish in mm-hmm. Canada. So what happened was there was a whole generation of kids that, uh, ind- indigenous kids that grew up without knowing their culture or their language. Mm-hmm. And, um, it just, you know, it, it just, it, it's done, uh, so much damage in those communities and it'll take, you know, generations to, to get back to, um, where they were, if ever, you know, but, um, so anyways, that, that I was, I had the, both the pleasure and the pain of being behind the camera and doing literally hundreds of hours of interviews with elders telling me these, these stories. Yeah. Um, and so fast forward to, to doing little bird, I was actually, that, this, that goes back like 15 years ago. I was doing that kind of work. Hmm. Um, so long before, cause it really, it's just been in the last like five, six years that in Canada it's become, um, a conversation, um, a more common conversation sure. about how to reconcile those things and that efforts are truly being made. Some would argue they're still not, but, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, and I want, so anyways, I want to do this cry, crazy science fiction story. And, and, and I'd been basically since I was a kid, I, I, um, have had my, uh, qualms with, um, the, the Christian, um, just, just the way I, I, I just, I, like, I remember going to Sunday school when I was a little kid and I just remember sitting there, it, I didn't go. My family didn't go, but I went with a friend. They said, why yeah. don't you come to church with us? And I, just, right. and I just had like so many questions. I'm like, but why would they do that? And how come if that's that, then that, like, it was just so, and I'm not looking to offend anybody. This is just my own like perspective on it. it There's so many contradictions mm-hmm. that I just could not line up in my head. And I was like eight, you know? <laughs> and then yeah. I think I was in the parking lot, literally like with the rest of the kids around going, well, have you thought about this? Because you know, that I got, I got kind of shooed off, and I think the um, the pastor actually suggested to my friend's mom said, "He doesn't have to come back next week. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's okay if." Uh, um, Polite way of discouraging those questions. Yeah, yeah. So, if some just like a very early age, it's just like things just didn't line up for me. I just I couldn't understand. It, it just it didn't make any sense, and it literally, literally felt um, untruthful, yeah. you know? And so anyways, going back to what I was originally describing, it was, it was just an accumulation of so many things over my life. And, um, but I wanted to tell a, a sci-fi epic because I was a Canadian filmmaker and everything always had to be small. You never, mm-hmm. you never had a budget, um, to do anything where you could realize a world like this. Yeah. Um, and then given the, given the, um, you know, the plot that I was playing with, I decided to, you know, make the, um, the protagonist, um, who she is, you know, which her, her mother's indigenous and to adopt some of those ideas in there. And even at the time of scripting, you know, largely, um, uh, anything, involving the environment, the indigenous are always on the front line of those, of, of protecting the environment, yeah. you know, the pipeline they're putting down here and lar- and it's, it's almost always women too. Um, so yeah, it was just sort of like an accumulation of, of a lot of, 
ideas and experiences from my life, sure. basically. Yeah. Sure. No, that all makes sense. How did you uh, wind up getting in contact with Ian Bertram as uh, as the artist for this project, who does uh, some truly incredible work, you know, alongside colorist Matt Hollingsworth? Yeah, uh, I wish it was a more exciting story, but I, I literally just, I think I, f I found his work on uh, DeviantArt. Yeah. Um, I think it was Ed Brisson who pointed it out to me. Yeah. Um, do you know Ed? Ed he, you know, he writes for Marvel. I'm familiar with his comics work, yeah. And I, yeah, yeah. I saw that you guys, uh, you co-wrote um, or worked together on The Orchard, which uh, I watched uh, somewhat recently, which which was an interesting comics connection that I, I didn't realize, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Ed is really the only person at that point I'd ever met in my life that worked in comics. Yeah. Um, and so it was... And Ed's a big part of this book happening because just for that reason that if you don't meet people or you don't see people who represent you um, doing things, um, you just don't believe it's possible, you know. Mm -hmm. And I met Ed and I thought, this guy writes comics. I mean, I've always wanted to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, Ed pointed out um, Ian's work on DeviantArt. And so I emailed Ian and just said, Hey, I wrote this comic called Little Bird. Would you be interested in looking at it? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he had done a couple of things, but at, at that point, um, Bowery Boys, which was published through Dark Horse, and mm -hmm. and a few th <clears throat> sort of small things for DC. Um, um, and yeah, he 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 emailed back, and I think he was. I think we, we remember this a little different when we talk about it, but I think he was a little bit skeptical, you know, just because I was just some guy up in Canada, you know, like writing some weird thing about, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, once he read it, he was he was interested, and it just kind of went from there. Very nice. Uh, you mentioned at the start of this, which I think is important to reiterate, we're recording this on June 1st, 2020. This is uh, the... The Monday after, um, you know, enormous um, protests across America and you're know, protesting racial injustice and, and police brutality. And I was struck rereading the material this weekend. You know, the fight for elders hope it's definitely a story of resistance and rebellion. Um, and the material is is, again, I don't want to equate the things. They're not the same, but it's it's pertinent how, you know, how the book's fiction feels um, uh, right now in terms of, you know, stories about resistance and you know i think there's a lot of questions right now people have about the right ways to rebel and i, I don't think little bird pretends to have the answers right but it's a, it's an example um what you mentioned what little birds rebellion i think is is born out of but you also mentioned some family uh kind of being involved in in these types of you know over overthrowing maybe is a strong word but upending status quo and those sorts of things uh is there I guess what are the examples that like this sort of rebellion or resistance work is is born out of in your own life? Um, lessons that you've picked up on that you're trying to thread through here, um, or any ideas you have in terms of like the shape of why this is necessary? I suppose. Yeah, it's just it's impossible to have any kind of change without resistance. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it, it is. Um, it, it just purely on almost a scientific level, it just doesn't work, you know. Um, things tend to flow in, flow down the path of least resistance. I mean, that is science. Right. That's just, you know, it's like if there's a river, it just literally flows the path of least resistance mm -hmm. um and the only thing that can obstruct that water and and cause it to move in a new direction is resistance and it's it's no different when it comes to um streams you know streams of water work the same way as as people in that in that respect um so obviously in little bird we're we're exploring that and because it's an epic sci-fi book it's largely done through 
um, big, bombastic, violent yeah. uh, con- conflicts. Um, but the reality is, in real life, um, it doesn't always need to be like that. There's resistance. You know, it, in fact, it's almost more effective, in my experience, that resistance resistance comes in smaller um, pieces. I, I I I keep thinking about this. Um, um, I, I I I actually almost wrote about it on social media, and now here I'm gonna. But then I I just thought I don't know, it didn't feel right. But mm-hmm. I, I I keep going back. I keep thinking about as an example of small moments of resistance that everyone can do and and it is um pregnant for white people to do you know more than ever Mm -hmm. um are those small acts of resistance like um you know when someone makes a a joke at a sexist or a racist joke or one that that's uh, homophobic you know just to not laugh Mm -hmm. just to be that person in the room that doesn't laugh and of course everything you you know like millions of years of evolution tells you to laugh Mm -hmm. because you don't want you know you're no one's looking for resistance you know um but as soon as you consciously make that decision not to, it actually becomes like a really powerful act of resistance. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and that's, you know, just a small thing that, that everyone can do. But um, anyway, I forgot the question. <laughs> now, but, um, no, no, that, that totally answers it. I mean, I, I think yeah. that's, that's what, what, well, that's what I'm leaning into um, is yeah. yeah what are, I guess, the, yeah, what are the lessons and, and what are the, the movements and small takeaways? And I think everyone has different takes on this, certainly. And that's OK. I think it's definitely the 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 ability to just talk about it now, I think, is more important than ever. Um, and and to learn and to grow if that's where you're at and, and to help in the ways that you can. Um, so it, it's not the same thing, um, but I think Christianity is is unquestionably the villain of this narrative. And yeah. that's another, obviously, topic that gets politicized and, and very sensitive for a lot of groups of people. Um, you know, within this amplified theocracy in the book, there's crusades level violence, right? It's all ruled by a very super villain pope. Like, it's not, yeah. you know, it's it's direct, right? You're not you're not beating around the bush. Um, what's your own, I, I guess you talked about this actually pretty effectively as far as your own religious background. Uh, I was curious if this was something you were de- deeply ingrained in and then came back around and and are now on the other side of it or sounds like not necessarily not something you really grew up with um were you worried though at all about the type of anger that this incites uh definitely the the catholic community catholic church has a pretty long history of you know condemnation of works that that target or that vilify catholicism uh was this something that worried you or it just felt like an important pretty natural story and and that wasn't something you were focused on yeah no it didn't worry me at all um you know i'm i come from um we 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 haven't had religion in my family for a long time so we're very openly atheist and we talk about um politics and religion um quite critically objectively openly Um, So it never really occurred to me until we started making the book. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not that Ian had a problem with any of it. He he didn't. But we would just naturally get into a conversation about scenes as we approach them. Yeah. Um, And I, it was really through his eyes in those conversations that I started to see, Oh, right. Like this might be really offensive to some people, but I didn't. Interesting. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't really, um, I don't live in that world. Um, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm aware that people will be offended, of course, but not, um, maybe not to the degree that, that, um, others might. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it was, it's, you know, it's, 
it, it's, um, you know, Mar Margaret Atwood said this about The Handmaid's Tale, which is, I haven't put anything in here, even though this is a fictional story, I haven't put anything in here that hasn't actually happened. Yeah, right. And, you know, that's not um, far off from um, a lot of the things that, that happen in Little Bird, too. It's, um, I think it's a shock to, you know, people now that, who, who, who don't understand history or haven't spent time um, reading about it. But, I mean, some, you know, really, really horrible things were done in the name of the church. Anyway, yeah, no, it, it's, I, I was never um, too worried about it. Okay. Myself, yeah, yeah, no, that's good. It, it, that is funny that it would have to come from an outside perspective um, to, to sort of like, you know, to, to have those eyes on, oh, this is probably going to uh, the, the Pope wielding, you know, these like genetically modified tentacle monsters and, <laughs> and all, the, all the violence might upset some people. Um, I, grew, I grew up in a very religious home myself, so I, I definitely come from that background and it's, you know, it's just a part of me. It's unshakable. And, and now I definitely question and I'm skeptical. I think that uh, context you provided at the front of this of um, indigenous peoples and, and the ways religion could be used sort of insidiously to, to take them from their culture and, and try to indoctrinate them towards, you know, the, the quote unquote, you know, right path of Christianity is, is yeah. fantastic context of what it, it, exactly what is being utilized in, in little bird, you know, because that now understanding that I can see why in many ways you would choose theocracy as the, the sort of ultimate evil of government. Um, because I think in one thing I was thinking about reading this is in a lot of ways, theocracy has almost taken a backseat over the last, uh, four -ish years. Um, in, in terms of like, it's just, it, it felt more pertinent, I suppose, during the Bush years in America, uh, the the conflation of politics and religion, whereas now it just seems so, and maybe this is just me getting older and where I am in my life, but it seems so disconnected from from the current establishment, yeah. Um, if you will, you know, it's not particularly Christian behavior to use to use those terms, right? Uh, a president yeah. being a a very outspoken bully on social media, for example, right? It's just so outwardly not that question so i was sort of like well is theocracy almost is it almost diminished in its power is it almost diminished in its as a threat i think you pulling the historical context of it and, and not that it's gone anywhere it's not it's not going anywhere right religion is still a, a major thing in the world and something mm -hmm. i look at often um but i think that provides context is that as far as kind of being the the big bad of the story and a target for you um was that something that you are, I guess let's, let's tie this to what's coming next, which is precious metal. Mm -hmm. Is that a thread that you're definitely looking to continue? Um, as you continue to work through this, it really just like dismantling or, or looking at sort of the evils of the way that religion can be misused. Um, or was that more a function of elders hope and maybe we go a different direction in the future and, and I don't want you to have to spoil anything, but just, no, no, no. Things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, the thing is, it, it's, the, you know, I, I just want to say like, you know, we, we could, we can always discuss the existence of God and that's completely, but that is irrelevant to, to what I'm writing about, mm -hmm. which is that the institution of religion, the church has al always been used as a weapon. Mm hmm always it, it's 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 not it's not like oh it's taken some you know bad turn in recent years it's that was literally um it's the and it's not just christianity it's all all religions within the institution of them they're developed and weaponized almost immediately mm -hmm. um and it's the easiest way to galvanize your community to follow through with the ideas that you feel are necessary in order to thrive within your own cultural beliefs, economic prosperity, um, 
And so it's those things I'm taking on. It's not that I have a problem or that I'm trying to demonize believers. Um, it's that um, I'm, and, and Christianity was really the only option because I want to tell a story set in North America. Right. And, um, but anyway, um, so that, that is sort of like the founding pillars of the little bird universe. Right. And, um, and precious metal takes place 35 years before little bird. Hmm. Um, and so it, it deals with, um, sort of the inception of, of bishops rise to power, although it's not specifically about that. Um, you get to kind of see like, where was the major turning point? Um, so yeah, I mean, to answer your question, it still is dealing with that subject matter. Um, a little bit less so than in Little Bird, because Little Bird is really the climax of that event. Hmm. Um, and we, that, you know, Ian and I are sort of developing this story in three parts which is Little Bird, if you imagine it as a triangle. <laughs> little Bird is here at the top. There's Precious Metal and there's Little Bird Book Two. Okay. And those three pieces of work will sort of like form a bigger picture and a bigger story. Um, so yeah, again, by the time I finish talking, I'm not really sure if I answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I, always, it's... I always forget where I... You know, by the time I get to the end, I don't know where. Yeah, I'm yeah. From. Like, did I answer that? No, it's totally fine. I mean, I want this to be, to be conversational by yeah. nature. So I think yeah. that 100 percent is addressing what I'm tr what I'm trying to get to in my own roundabout way as I you know try to explore these these larger things with you um, on the go. I, do you have a sense of timing for uh, for both Precious Metal and Little Bird Two? Little Bird Two, no, that's it'll be quite a ways off. But um, Precious Metal. We are aiming for the end of the year. It might end up being early next year. Um, sure. We, yeah, we, we're taking like a long. Um, uh, well, we, we're we're going to complete the book before mm -hmm. we release the first issue. Okay. And it's uh, going to be a six issue series. Yeah. As far as far as I can tell, um, and each one is like like Little Bird. It's like you know thirty six to forty pages. Like they're big books yeah and um and you know ian is just like killing it he's just like smashing these pages like yeah it's, it's really his next level um so putting a ton of time into it so yeah hopefully early next year is kind of what we're aiming for excellent excellent i'm really looking forward to that i you mentioned ian there the artist on this who's doing obviously work that has been very rightly celebrated um, as as some of the best in comics. There are some really cool inventive layouts in Little Bird, and, yeah. and I imagine to come in Precious Metal. As this is your first published comics work, um, how much how much in terms of layout did you were you looking to put into script uh, versus uh, certainly the, just the collaborative nature of it with Ian, but but letting him kind of have free reign um, to, to try and experiment things on his own. <clears throat> yeah, basically both. So I, I give pretty specific, um, panel breakdowns. Mm -hmm. Basically the way I look at it is it's, it's my job to, and I, not, not everybody works this way, but, um, to give the artist Ian, um, to be as specific as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, but also to give him the complete freedom to change things whenever he feels like it's better, you know, yeah. which is often. Um, so he'll like do a layout, send me a picture, call me up and say, Hey, I saw what you're, you know, I see what you're trying to do here, but I was thinking if we did this it might work a little better for this reason. And uh, most of the time I'm like, yeah, great. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's really, it's, it's so important that, um, that the artist tells their own version of the story um, in order to co-author it, you know, like a, right. it, it really, 
I don't know. It, it just it, it it just wouldn't be as good, and it also wouldn't be as fun. <laughs> yeah, you know. So um, generally, if he wants to change things, I it's it's usually for the better, and I'm fine with it. Cool. Cool. That being said, I'll, I'll earmark certain things that, um, like a lot of my writing is really there's a certain amount of um, uh, there's a cyclical nature to the work, I guess. And so um, not only just in like, you know, themes that come up in dialogue and stuff, but also um, visually. Mm -hmm. So there are certain scenes where it's going to be referenced later in the work. Um, so it needs more of a specific pattern for that reason. Like, um, but also Ian and I work on a lot of that stuff together where I'll just say, you know, like the layout of this page or the pacing of this scene is we're going to see that again here for this reason. So how, what do you think is the best way to, to approach that? Just get, that's cool. Yeah. I noticed in issue one and issue five is probably the most obvious example where the, the dialogue is reused from the opening and then it kind of comes back around. Are those layouts the same? I I'll admit I didn't notice that. They might be. Yeah. I can't okay. remember, but, but quite often like, yeah, I mean, sometimes we're doing stuff like that and like nobody's ever going to notice it, but we do. And and uh, it makes us excited about the book. Now I'm just looking, but. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's yeah. a nice, uh, you mentioned the cyclical nature. I mean, it's a nice, yeah. I, I appreciated that in in the dialogue or in the in the narration yeah. where it's right. We started here and now we come back around and it has a new meaning right by the end of the book. Um, yeah. You kind of now we have more context, right, for that world. I think of that visually is doing the same thing. That's a really cool little trick even if it's you know relatively unobserved <laughs> yeah suppose. exactly it's you know yeah. you, you may be the only one who ever notices it but yeah we did do stuff like that and we do and in precious metal um i think we're putting even more thought into that mm. those those type of things so it's basically like it's there for people who want to find it and yeah i think the you know ian and i have this idea that we're trying to create work that is, you know, more about rereading than reading um, mm. to try and give, yeah, you know. I like that. I like that idea. I talk a lot about comics. Obviously, there's, I read a lot of superhero comics and I talk a lot about my lack of desire to reread <laughs> yeah. most stories, frankly, right. yeah. um, once I have them, I'm, I'm good. And I, there's so many new things out in culture to consume, right. That you, you feel that like there's always something new, uh, little bird, I would say is, is definitely on that short list of works that, that a reread actually adds a lot. I think a big part of that is one thing I think you, you do very well in storytelling is you leave open spaces. You leave, um, I had a conversation um, last week with Ryan O'Sullivan, writer of Fearscape from Vault Comics. Oh, which is great. About, yeah. yeah, which I, I love the work. That's I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, he talks a lot about letting readers build bridges, right? And and leaving gaps and letting them build one bridge to the other. This is something I noticed you doing uh, in The Orchard, which I watched your film work, where there's a lot of open-ended questions. It's a short film, 16 minutes. You don't get all the background in exposition, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you leave many questions. Yeah, and I think that that is appealing to some, and some people are going to go away and say that didn't make any sense, right? It's yeah. it's up to up to the audience, I think. Um, with with precious metal, you're going back thirty five years. Are you given that sort of storytelling approach? Not that you can't try different things, obviously. Are mm -hmm. you looking to fill in more gaps, or are you looking to continue that approach with a a new story? I guess what is the inspiration for um, going backwards, going to a prologue? Yeah, that's such a good question. I don't know if I have the answer, but um, to why we're doing a prologue, but I can I can say that I almost we almost didn't do it um, mm. because um, I hate prequels <laughs> <laughs> because they they usually they they exist to capitalize on the last thing and they do fill in the blanks and it's it is less interesting and um, but I think that. It's not, it, I, I, the reason we went ahead with it and, and I'm okay with it is because 
it's not really that type of storytelling isn't really within me anyway um i don't like you said even if you look at my short films they're not that they just leave a ton to for the audience to be um involved in Mm -hmm. um and um Sorry, I'm really stuffed up right now from seasonal allergies. So it's I, <laughs> I get I get the same thing. So I can't breathe no and talk at the same time, which makes me kind of dumb. But um, <laughs> it's a challenge, yeah. You know, when blood doesn't get up there, it stops things. But um, yeah, so it's so no. Uh, li- uh, sorry, precious metal is it, it's a, it's a completely new story. Um, it's it's only made it more fun in that we can tell this new story while finding things to to fill in um a few of the questions that it might have come up in little bird but it's not there to answer them okay um and you know still it, it, it's uh lots for the readers to be involved in in terms of like you said building bridges um so yeah, it, it's a fine it's it's a fine line though. You you do have to be careful. I mean, mm-hmm. um, you the last thing you want to do is um, start making Star Wars prequels. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the definitely the big example and culture of of why you should not do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to it. Definitely, I think um, I, I expect that that you and Ian and the team uh, will have a a smart way to to approach that that isn't um isn't just the the negatives of of prequel culture um, i have i have full confidence in that anything else that uh works that you want to plug um things you have coming out uh comics film whatever it might be uh well i'm working on a, a graphic novel called the nature of light uh mm-hmm. with renee nault who mm-hmm. did the graphic novel adaptation of handmaid's tale mm-hmm. um <clears throat> it's it's almost pointless bringing it up right now because it's going to be so long before it's done and out. But uh, that is something else I'm working on. Um, I'm also working on a shorter story called The Color, uh, sorry, The Cutting Garden with Erin Connolly, who is, um, she's a watercolor artist, lives mm. in, in, in America. Um, and yeah, a couple of little things that I can't really say anything about right now, but that's sure. that's really the the main stuff. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. 